people glorious and arrogant, valiant and headstrong. These were the men and women who laid the very foundations of Western civilization. Their monuments still recall perhaps the most extraordinary two centuries in history. A time which saw the birth of science and politics, philosophy, literature and drama. Which saw the creation of art and architecture. We still strive to equal. The Greeks achieved all this against a backdrop of war and conflict. For they would vanquish armies, navies, empires many times their size, and build an empire of their own which stretched across the Mediterranean. For one brief moment, the mighty warships of the Greeks ruled the seas, their prosperity unequal. These achievements, achievements which still shape our world, were made not by figures lost to time, but by men and women whose voices we can still hear, whose lives we can still follow. Men such as Themistocles, one of the world's greatest military generals. Pericles, a politician of vision and genius and Socrates, the most famous philosopher in history. This is the story of these astonishing individuals, of the rise and fall of a civilization that changed the world. BC, five centuries before the birth of Christ. In a town called Athens, a tiny city in mainland Greece, pandemonium ruled the streets. The ordinary people had turned on their rulers, demanding freedom from centuries of oppression. At this moment, one man looked on, an Athenian nobleman named Cleisthenes. Cleisthenes had been brought up from birth to be a ruler, to look down on these common people with contempt. But this one night would be a turning point. In his life, in the history of Greece and in the history of civilization. In a flash of inspiration, Cleisthenes would see that these ordinary people should have freedom, a chance to shape their own destiny, to govern themselves. And with this decision, Cleisthenes would set his fellow Greeks on the path to empire. Historians estimate that Cleisthenes was born around 570 BC. He was hardly the type to become a man of the people, for he had been born into one of the richest families in Greece, his home a palace by the standards of the day.
Bisonese family were called the Alcamayanids. They were a wealthy and long-established political dynasty. He grew up in a world of great privilege. A world in which men of an elite background would expect to have certain privileges just given to them. The origin of Cleisthenes' family fortune is a tale typical of ancient Greece. A curious story lost half in myth. The first Greek historian, Herodotus, claims that Cleisthenes' grandfather once performed a favor for a great king named Croesus, a king of immeasurable wealth. In return, he was told he could take a gift of gold dust from Croesus' treasury. But according to Herodotus, Cleisthenes' ancestor couldn't restrain himself just to loading up his pockets. He stuffed every orifice of his body, his ears and his mouth, with shimmering gold dust, and then poured more over his head and hair. And Herodotus writes that King Croesus was so amused by this bravado that he let him take all the gold he was carrying and as much again. But whatever the source of Cleisthenes' family wealth, there is no doubt that they had used it effectively to gain power. From his earliest days, the young Cleisthenes was taught that he was an aristocrat, ancient Greek for a member of the ruling class. In the 6th century BC, these aristocrats controlled everything that happened in Cleisthenes' hometown. A small settlement called Athens. Athens lay in the center of a Mediterranean peninsula which Cleisthenes knew as Hellas, and which we now call Greece. In the days of Cleisthenes' youth, it would have seemed impossible that this city would soon rule an empire. It certainly is not what we call a city. Forget Manhattan. Athens in the center has public buildings, but otherwise I think one should imagine more village style of uh, accommodation and habitation. The town was built around the Acropolis, a steep-sided outcrop of bare rock, a stronghold from which the Athenians could fend off the attacks of their neighbors. In the narrow streets surrounding the Acropolis huddled the simple homes of farmers and tradesmen. Most of the houses, perhaps mud brick, uh, there was no sewage, there was no waste collection. We would find it very much like wandering through a third world village. You would certainly be able to smell Athens as you approached it. For men, life was passed working in the fields or in basic crafts. Women spent their days cloistered in the home, cooking, spinning, weaving. For these Athenians, reading and writing was a rare skill. There was nothing that we might call science or medicine. Life expectancy at birth was less than 15 years. I think the idea that ancient Greek life was nasty, brutish and short would be entirely accurate. Certainly, life was extremely tough. This was no society of equals. The common Athenians lived under the yoke of the aristocrats, men such as Cleisthenes' father. The 
traditional political milieu from which Cleisthenes arose was one in which all effective political power was being dominated by a relative handful of people. The possibility that the ordinary people of Athens would actually matter was the furthest thing from the mind of the traditional Greek elites. For the Greek writer Aristotle, this was a world riven by injustice. The whole country was in the hands of a few people. The hardest and bitterest thing for the masses was their state of serfdom. Not that they weren't discontented with anything else, for to speak generally, they had no part nor share in anything. Athens was, in a sense, turned against itself. You had one part of the population, the aristocratic elite, holding power at the expense of the rest of the citizen population. Dominated by aristocrats interested only in preserving their own power, Athens hardly seemed a state on the verge of building a great empire. But then Greece also seemed an unlikely land to give rise to greatness. If you look at the physical world of Greece, it's not the kind of place that you'd immediately expect to produce a great civilization. Simply too many mountains. Greece does not have the obvious kind of physical unity that typically seems to be associated with the really great uh, imperial civilizations of the ancient world. The great civilizations of Cleisthenes' day had grown up around rivers and the fertile plains stretching from their banks. To the south of Greece lay Egypt, where the regular flooding of the Nile sustained a civilization already 2,000 years old. And to the east lay the Persians, At the heart of their empire lay the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This was the very birthplace of civilization. The home of the world's first cities. But mainland Greece had no great open plains. This was a landscape riven by mountain ranges. Off her coast lay countless tiny islands. It seemed impossible for a single ruler to dominate this fragmented world. Instead, Greece was divided into countless tiny nations called city-states each fiercely independent, each with its own culture and history. In Cleisthenes' time, there were over a thousand of these city-states, jostling with each other for land and power. They never were politically unified, or at least in the classical period, never politically unified. And indeed, each individual Greek city-state, each polis, sought to maintain its own independence, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. In the early 6th century, Athens was not nearly the most powerful or important of these tiny nations. Argos had stood for over a thousand years. Her citizens were able to trace their history back to the mythical days of the Trojan War. The Corinthians dominated Greek trade. Their ships plied the Mediterranean, ferrying goods back and forth from Egypt, Assyria, and Italy. But there was one city-state which had military power, which appeared that it might come to dominate all of Cleisthenes Greece. In the south of Greece, around the reed beds of the river Eurotas, lay the city-state of Sparta. The 
The Spartans were brought up from birth to be soldiers, raised in the field, separated from their families, their lives structured around discipline and war. The center of an average Spartan man's life was his barracks, and he was brought up to be a military man. The Spartans lived a life stripped of comforts, with few possessions apart from their weapons, and their cloaks dyed red to conceal their or their victim's blood. Spartans were brought up to put up with anything and all sorts of stories, uh, the best being of a visiting Sybarite, visiting Sparta, eating the local food and saying now he understood why the Spartans were so willing to die because death was as nothing to eating their food. The Spartans were ruthless expansionists. By Cleisthenes' time, they had conquered all of the surrounding regions, more than 4,000 square miles. And they had reduced these conquered populations to a slave class known as the Helots. The Helots were forced to work in the fields for their Spartan overlords, and they were ruled with an iron fist. The Spartans every year declared war on the Helots and the point of this was partly of course to reinforce their sense of identity as a warrior community but also rather calculatingly to make it legitimate to kill a Helot and Helot culling as opposed to killing was a regular practice. If there was any part of Cleisthenes Greece that looked like it might build an empire, it was Sparta. For the rest of the Greeks, they were a threat always on the horizon. This was the world of Cleisthenes' childhood brought up a member of a self-interested elite in a state that was only a third-rate power. It was an unlikely beginning for the man who would set Greece on the path to empire. But then Cleisthenes had always been a man fired by a dream. A uniquely Greek vision of the greatness a man could achieve. If there was one thing that inspired Cleisthenes and his fellow Greeks, it was their stories, ancient tales and myths. The country was continually crisscrossed by hundreds of traveling bards who recited these stories to whoever would pay. These were people who, in an age without writing, had memorized over a million lines of poetry. It's very easy to underestimate the power of the human memory when we live in a culture like ours, which has so many means for recording things. Before the Greeks got the alphabet, they seem to have been able to remember vast tracts of poetry and pass it on over the generations in a quite remarkable way. These travelling bards would have regularly visited the Athens of Cleisthenes' childhood, and their stories would have influenced and shaped him from his earliest days. The two most famous tales these singers told are still preserved. The Iliad and the Odyssey, composed by the legendary poet Homer. These works tell of mighty battles and epic struggles. 
and at their heart lie the heroes. Mythical figures whose strength had won them power and glory. Heroes, almost by definition, were doers of great deeds. The more heads you knocked and uh, the more young women that you deflowered, the greater your heroic status. Images of heroes are found all over Greek art. These warlike figures, valiant, beautiful, determined to seize victory at all costs, were the Greek ideal. The heroic ideal was absolutely central for the whole world of Greek culture. Heroes were terrific achievers, and one might hope to achieve heroic status by modeling oneself on the deeds of, for example, Achilles. Achilles was the archetypal Greek hero. As a child, he had been offered the choice between a long, ordinary life or a brief burst of glory in the battlefield. Achilles' choice had been an early death and eternal fame. This, the vision of the hero, the ideal of the man of action, was the model that Cleisthenes was brought up to follow. to pursue a life of greatness and glory. One through strength and valor. To seize power and victory for himself and himself alone. to become a real-life hero. But Cleisthenes was not the only one to take the tales of the mythical heroes to heart. There's a big change in the middle of the 6th century when one man seizes control of the government as what the Greeks called a tyrant. The story of how this tyrant or sole ruler came to power has been preserved by the historian Herodotus. One day, a man of dignified and noble bearing rode into the city of Athens. Beside him stood a tall and beautiful woman. A woman he claimed was the patron goddess of Athens, Athena. This dashing figure demanded that he be given the rule of Athens, for like one of Homer's heroes, he had the protection of a goddess. Surprisingly, he was welcomed by the Athenians as their new ruler. Despite the fact that the goddess was simply a particularly tall girl from a neighboring village. And a heroic figure was an ordinary man called Pisistratus. Pleisthenes' own brother-in-law. Pisistratus was, I think, an excellent politician. He was a man without doubt, with an eye for the main chance. But as he consolidated his rule, it became clear that Pisistratus had far greater ambitions than simply gaining power. 
Pisistratus was an extremely intelligent man. He clearly understood that if he was going to maintain control of Athens, if he was going to be able to consolidate his rule and pass it on to his sons, which is clearly his ambition, he would have to find allies. Pisistratus took an extraordinary step. He turned to the common Athenians for support undermining the whole hierarchy of aristocrats and commoners that had endured for centuries. Isistratus reduced taxes and introduced free loans to allow the people to build up their farms. And by offering the Athenians the chance of prosperity, Isistratus began to transform his city. With the rise of Pisistratus, we start to see the success of agrarianism accelerated at Athens. And that's going to be a kernel that's going to grow and grow and grow in the ensuing two centuries. And one of the results of that is we see more vines and olives. Olive trees manifest themselves in every aspect of Greek culture. Economically, they allow people to have cooking oil, they allow people to eat olives, they allow people to use lubricants, soap, fuel, so it's a very valuable economic commodity. The land around Athens produced excellent olives, the best in the Greek world. And as production soared, the Athenians found a ready market for this oil. not only in the other Greek states, but across the sea, in Egypt, in Phoenicia, Persia, and Assyria. For Athens was ideally situated to export to the entire eastern Mediterranean. Greece is in the middle of an extraordinary grouping of ancient civilizations. It's bounded on the east by the great Persian Empire, on the south by the age-old civilization of Egypt, on the west, the Etruscans and the Romans. Greeks were scattered. Plato has a rather nice phrase, like ants or frogs round a pond. The Eastern Mediterranean was the greatest marketplace of the ancient world. It seemed that everyone had something to sell. Grain from Scythia, salt fish from the Black Sea, wine from the great vineyards of the island of Chios, gold, silver, art and finery from Egypt. And everyone was willing to trade for Athenian olive oil. As goods flowed in and out of the Athenian harbor, the Athenians found their wealth and prosperity on the rise. But the most astonishing consequence of Athens' sudden expansion was to be found in the darkest streets of the city. Athens' first great artistic legacy, the vase. I think what, what's fascinating about the pottery is that in its own time, it wasn't a big deal artistically. What was inside the pots was almost invariably worth more than the pot itself. Here in the area known as the Keramikos, ancient Athens red light district, could also be found the potter's workshops. These common artisans were amongst the lowest of the low in Athenian society. If you were a potter in Athenian society, I won't say you were the scum of the earth, but you certainly um, had no special respect. It was hard, incessant work, unenvied by the citizen population. 
Pottery had been a staple across the ancient world for hundreds of years, used in the kitchen at home and for transporting oils and food. But it had always been simple in design, using geometric patterns and basic figures, designs based on Egyptian and Assyrian art. But Athenian potters, as they decorated their work, began to develop a whole new style of painting, a freshness and a naturalism never before seen, a style still astonishing today. It's now become almost commonplace for a Greek vase on the modern antiquities market to fetch millions of dollars or pounds. And if the makers of those vases had any idea of what we were shelling out for them, their graves would spin with either resentment or just absolute hilarity. These Athenian potters seem to have been motivated not by the idea of producing great art for eternity, but of outdoing each other. On one particularly fine vase, we find the proud comment, Euthymides, son of Polyas, drew this. And then underneath, and I'll bet Euphronius couldn't have managed it. For the first time in their history, the ordinary Athenians had tasted freedom. And they had shown their capacity for extraordinary achievement. Cleisthenes grew to manhood under Pisistratus' rule. And he saw how Athens changed. His home had turned from a modest rural settlement into an international economic power. Pisistratus' rule of benevolent tyranny was not to last forever. In the year 527 BC, he died and was laid to rest here in the Athenian graveyard. His son, Hippias, took over. At first, Hippias followed in his father's footsteps, ruling Athens with a fair hand. But soon, the Athenians discovered the perilous nature of tyranny. Historians tell us that in the year 514 BC, Hippias' brother was murdered. Aggrieved and bitter, the tyrant's behavior completely changed. Hippias not only executed the murderers, but cruelly tortured one of their wives to death as well. Aristotle described the ruler's slide towards madness. After this, the tyranny became much, much harsher, for Hippias ordered numerous executions and sentences of exile in revenge for his brother. And he became embittered and suspicious of everybody. The freedoms that the common Athenians had gained under Pisistratus were now stripped away. There was now a real tyranny in the modern sense in Athens. Pisistratus had come into power for a cause his son now had no cause other than self-preservation.
life for Tleisthenes had now become increasingly dangerous. For the paranoid dictator knew that it was from here, from the aristocrats, that the greatest threat to his power could come. And Hippias' fears would be proved right. With the hardening of the attitude of the tyranny, the time now seemed to be ripe. Cleisthenes decided to take his first great gamble. He would try to overthrow Hippias, to gain power for himself and his family. Cleisthenes' ambition to make his mark upon the scene is something that, of course, would have been impressed on him from a very early age. From the stories of the heroes that they need to succeed and to strike at the right time. For Cleisthenes himself, it would be an achievement. Cleisthenes assembled a conspiracy to overthrow the tyrant. Hippias was trapped in his stronghold, captured and banished from Athens forever. The year was 510 BC, and Cleisthenes was now one of the most powerful figures in Athens. He had lived up to the heroic myths he'd been brought up to follow since childhood. But Greek society was changing. The heroic urge that drove Cleisthenes was no longer reserved for the elite. It was now permeating every level of Greek society. This is Olympia in southern Greece. Here, once every four years, men from across the Greek world would gather to compete in a vast contest of athletic skill. This was the ancestor of the modern Olympic Games. For the ancient travel writer Pausanias, the Olympics were the highlight of any visit to Greece. Many are the sights to be seen in Greece, and many are the wonders to be heard. But on nothing does heaven bestow more care than the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games were founded in 776 BC, two centuries before Cleisthenes had even been born. Then they had been an exclusive competition for the wealthiest of the Greeks. But by Cleisthenes' time, the Games had evolved to allow anyone to take part. A nobleman could now race against a potter, a king against a fishmonger. The Olympic Games were a chance for any Greeks to display the sort of heroic qualities that uh, the heroes of Homer had displayed. The competitions had their roots and the skills required on the ancient battlefield. Chariot racing. Running. Wrestling. Boxing. But here there was no real prize, just a wreath of olives and fame throughout Greece. A competitor would be surrounded by the largest gathering of Greeks in peace that he would ever experience. Perhaps as many as 40,000 Greeks would gather for the Olympic Games. Greeks would travel hundreds of miles to attend the Olympics. And during the festival, the land surrounding the stadiums would be covered with encampments.
But the games were very much a male experience. Women were prohibited from entering the competitions or even the stadium. But for the Greek man, whatever his origin or class, to win here would be the highlight of his life. You had, uh, briefly, a moment of glory, of extreme fame, which was what the competitive culture of the Greeks valued so highly. Here, the Greeks had perhaps found a civilized way to satisfy the heroic ideal. They had built a meritocracy based on skill and ability, where anyone could win. But a world where everyone could seize victory could only make Athens even more unstable. As soon as Cleisthenes gained power, he found that others were conspiring against him. Here, heroism still meant one thing. Seize power whenever and however you can. The only rule is that you get what you can and that you fight. You have to go in there and show that you can win. The most ambitious of those conspiring against Cleisthenes was a man named Isagoras. Isagoras was another Athenian aristocrat. He, too, had been brought up to believe that power was his right. But Isagoras also knew that he could not gain power on his own. Isagoras took an unprecedented step. He turned outside Athens for support. He sent a message to the Spartans, Greece's most feared warriors. Isagoras was an old friend of the Spartans. Rumor had it that he had shared his wife with the Spartan king. The Spartans immediately provided a force of their finest troops to back up Isagoras' bid for power. To help him betray his city. Isagoras really was upping the stakes. He brought in the most powerful state in Greece. It was pretty clear he was going to turn Athens into a subject state to Sparta. With his Spartan force, Isagoras staged a coup, seizing control of Athens. He and his troops would rule from the high point of the city, the stronghold atop the Acropolis. The first targets of the new tyrant were the other aristocrats. Pleisthenes, most of all. Over 700 households were cast out of Athens, including Cleisthenes and his entire family. Cleisthenes would leave his city, living once again under the hand of a despotic dictator. A dictator who now ruled with the support of the most fearsome power in Greece, the Spartans. For Cleisthenes, all his childhood lessons seemed betrayed. He had been brought up to be an aristocrat and a ruler. To emulate the mythical heroes. 
But all this had led to was conflict and feuding, death and exile, power struggles amongst an aristocratic elite. How could Athens ever escape from this pointless cycle of violence? But even as Cleisthenes agonized in exile, Athens was rocked by an extraordinary event. Like their mythical heroes, the ordinary people of Athens now took their destiny into their own hands. They rose up in revolution. Pythagoras and his Spartan allies blockaded themselves atop the Acropolis, the high point of the city. But even there, they could not escape the fury of the common Athenians. For two days and nights, Pythagoras held out against this extraordinary uprising. Until finally, on the morning of the third day, he was forced to surrender. The year was 508 BC. This would be Athens' first step to empire and glory. For the first time in recorded history, the people had turned on their rulers and seized power for themselves. Athens at this point is in control of the mob, the ordinary people who had risen up without organized leadership, and then the question is, what happens now? At this new dawn, the Athenian people now turned to one man. A figure whose life, whose experiences and disappointments had given him a unique vision. Cleisthenes was recalled from exile and asked to build a government. When Cleisthenes returned to Athens after the expulsion of the Spartans, he faced a really remarkable challenge. There was no possibility for just simply putting back in power a group of aristocrats. There was no possibility for him to declare himself tyrant. In a sense, what Cleisthenes had to do is design a revolutionary governmental solution for a revolutionary political situation. For Cleisthenes, the problem was how to give his fellow Athenians the say in their future that he knew they must now have. On an Athenian hillside, he had a great meeting place carved out from the bare rock. Here, in the shadow of the Acropolis, the citizens of Athens could now gather to discuss the future of their state. On these very steps, rich and poor alike could stand and address their fellow citizens. This is the ancestor of the British House of Commons, the American Congress of Parliaments across the world. And where government had once been decided by the strength of a sword arm or the thrust of a sharpened spear, Cleisthenes instituted the simple vote. A white pebble for yes, a black pebble for no. 
And with this elegant and simple idea, Cleisthenes instituted the rule of the people. A system of government which we now know as democracy. The Great Athenian Assembly would gather every nine days to vote on issues covering the entire administration of the state. From the raising of taxes to the building of roads. From the price of figs to the declaration of war. Athenian democracy is a very different sort of democracy from ours. One has a sense, as an Athenian citizen, that you really can make a difference. There is no us and them. There is no government separate from the ordinary Athenian citizen body. They are the government. Democracy represented a sharp break. An originally elitist, heroic culture was now turned on its head and the idea was that even ordinary Greeks who weren't aristocratic, who were not rich, could be, as it were, heroes in politics. It was a system of government that would transform this tiny state and would set off one of the greatest flowerings of civilization the world had ever seen. It's not just an accident that you had democracy and you had this tremendous flourishing of culture. Uh, I think that democracy really does, in a very real way, unleash, make, make possible potentials within human societies that are very unlikely to be unleashed, to be made actual in any other way. The Athenians would take what had been the greatest achievements of the ancient world and transform them. They would take the monumental pyramids and temples of the Egyptian pharaohs and with them build an architecture of grace and splendor. They would take the myths and tales of the traveling bards and transform them into theater, entertainment for a whole city. And the great stone sculptures of Assyria and Egypt would be remade with an intimacy and emotion that still touches us today. But just as Cleisthenes' democracy was gaining strength, a new threat was gathering in the east. The mighty Persian Empire. The Persians were the greatest power of the day. They ruled an empire that stretched from India to the Mediterranean. But as Athens had grown in power and confidence, the Persians realized that this tiny state on their eastern border might soon pose a threat. They mobilized a force of 30,000 men to invade Greece immediately. Cleisthenes' democracy, hardly born, was now to face its greatest test.
Greece, the year 490 BC. Here, a revolution has begun that will change the world. In a moment of chaos and anarchy, the people of a tiny state named Athens have seized control of their city and established democracy for the first time in history. But now this tiny state will face a greater challenge. Athens will be pitted against the greatest power of the day, the tyrannical Persian Empire. In a contest spread across land and sea that will last over a decade, Athenian democracy will be tested in the crucible of war. This is the story of an extraordinary moment in history and of two men who would change the course of civilization. Themistocles, a military genius of the ancient world, and Pericles, a visionary whose legacy still shapes the world today. This is the story of the Greeks. BC. A lone figure runs across the mountainous terrain of Greece. His name is Pheidippides, citizen of a tiny democracy named Athens. On this day, Pheidippides will make one of the most astonishing athletic achievements in history. The inspiration for our modern marathon. But Pheidippides' quest is not for glory, but survival. His homeland is about to be conquered by the mighty Persian Empire. In the early 5th century BC, the Persians were the greatest power on the world stage. Their vast empire stretched from India in the east to Turkey in the west. Now, out on their western frontier, the tiny state of democratic Athens was gaining power. This was a threat that the Persians would have to destroy. The Persians lived in a culture of unbending tyranny. At the head of their empire sat Darius known to the Greeks only as the Great King. Suppliants had to cover their mouths in his presence just to avoid tainting the air he breathed. For Pheidippides and the democratic Athenians, conquest by Darius and the Persians would mean the destruction of their entire way of life. There is a huge cultural difference between the Greeks and the Persians. The Greeks are a people who emphasize freedom. The Persians would put far more emphasis on obedience. It's a struggle between freedom and slavery. The Persian force landed at a sandy bay called Marathon, just 26 miles from Athens. News of the invasion spread through the streets like wildfire. This was a city without a standing army. Every male citizen would have to come to the defense of his state. The poorer citizens have spears, sticks, bows and arrows, whatever weapons they can find. But the heart of the Athenian force would be the hoplites, men who could afford heavy bronze armor, a shield, 
a spear, a sword. The Athenians would field a small but determined force. That's probably the first time in the history of the Athenian state that the entire population had been mustered. And for them to field 10,000 hoplites out of a citizenry that might have only been 20 or 30,000, it's a level of involvement that's astounding. But as they faced the Persians on the battlefield, the Athenians held out little hope of victory. They were outnumbered by two to one. Pheidippides' desperate mission was to run for help from one of Athens' local rivals, the Greek state of Sparta. Even as he ran, Pheidippides must have imagined the horror that his fellow Athenians now faced. You're dodging spears from your men in front and your men in behind, but you probably couldn't see or hear. All you would feel would be pressure. You wouldn't see the sword plunge that took one of your testicles off. You would not see the spear thrust that took your head off. You would have no idea what was going on, just the momentum that carried you ahead. All you would be aware of is that you had to push forward and keep stabbing and keep on your feet and you would hope that everybody else would do that. Phidippides run was to become the stuff of legend. Fired by the terror that his fellow citizens were being slaughtered, he ran 140 miles in just two days. But Phidippides' quest would end in failure. Help would be refused. He was left only with the knowledge that his fellow Athenians would have to fight alone. Pheidippides could never have imagined that the Greeks would in fact win a glorious victory. The Athenians had rushed at their foe in a headlong charge. And the Persians had scattered in the face of their assault. The Athenians slaughtered over 6,000 Persians in one fateful day. The world's first democracy had survived its first great test. Every Athenian knew that he had voted to fight and that this reflected the majority vote of the citizens, and that was not true of the Persians. Whatever you want to say about democracy, it fields the most patriotic, enthusiastic, and often large armies. The Athenians returned to their city to celebrate their victory. But amongst them, was one for whom the war with Persia had only just begun. An Athenian general named Themistocles. Themistocles had fought on the battlefield at Marathon.
he was typical of a new generation of Athenian leaders, a man who had risen to power through democracy. Themistocles is a fascinating character, very much an example of the effect of democracy uh, in Athens. It's relatively clear that he doesn't come from the inner circle of the landed aristocracy that traditionally had ruled in Athens. There were stories told about his feeling rather touchy about the fact that he hadn't had a traditional aristocratic upbringing, for example, in music and uh, poetry. In fact, that might have given him a spur to, to show that he could do as well as someone who had gone to all the right schools, as it were. Themistocles' opinion of his common origins was blunt and straightforward. I may not know how to play the lyre or flute, but I do know how to make a city great. Themistocles had learned the skills of leadership here, the Democratic Assembly of Athens. Here, any Athenian could stand before his fellow citizens and try to convince them to follow his leadership. From this very podium, Themistocles would now show himself to be one of history's greatest leaders. The savior of his city. For Themistocles alone recognized that the Persians might still be a danger. And that next time, victory for the Athenians might not prove so easy. Themistocles realized that the Persians, if they came again, it would be in a way that made sure that they weren't going to be defeated by land again. There was no way that the Athenians could rely on traditional hoplite fighting technique. Themistocles began to form a bold new strategy, employing the most advanced weapon of the day, the trireme. Triremes had been developed by the Greek state of Corinth, the ancient world's finest shipbuilders. Stacking 170 oarsmen on three levels, their combination of light weight and raw power gave them astonishing speed and maneuverability. There was nothing else like them on the water. In contemporary terms, a trireme is a missile. The object of a trireme is to ram the enemy's ship. It is a very narrow, very light, very sleek, and very fast weapon. But these triremes were also exceedingly expensive. And Themistocles' vision of a vast Athenian navy might never have come to pass if it had not been for one stroke of luck. In the year 483 BC, the Athenians discovered a great vein of silver in their territory. Worth a hundred talents, a vast amount in the ancient world. The Athenians wanted to divide these newfound riches among themselves. But then Themistocles stood up in the assembly. He wanted to spend the money on ships. But he also knew that this would be a hard proposal to sell. And so Themistocles played a complex bluff. His argument is not that the money should be used to build a fleet against Persia, but rather it should be used to build a fleet against Athens' local rival, uh, the Greek city-state of Aegina. The reason Themistocles does this is that he knew it would simply be too upsetting to remind people of the Persian threat. 
it's a difficult argument to make and a tribute to his political skill uh, that he's able to do it. Themistocles convinced the Athenians to build the greatest naval force in Greece. And not a moment too soon. The great Persian king Darius died in 486 BC and his son Xerxes assumed his father's throne. Xerxes' first action was to vow vengeance for his father's defeat at the hands of the Athenians. On my father's behalf, and on behalf of all my subjects, I will not rest until I have taken Athens and burnt it to the ground. As an imperial power, the Persians cannot allow small regional states like this to uh, beat them with impunity. Xerxes began to gather his forces. He conscripted troops from every corner of his empire. Arabians, Egyptians, Phoenicians, as well as Persians. Rumors began to leak back to Athens that Xerxes' army numbered nearly two million men that it was the greatest force the world had ever seen, that soon it would be ready to march. And then finally, in the spring of 480 BC, news reached Athens. The Persian army had set out for Greece. History records that Xerxes' troops drank rivers dry. Trampled fields to the raw earth. Ravaging the land as they marched on towards Greece. Xerxes was confident of victory. We shall so extend the empire of Persia that its boundaries will be God's own sky so that the sun will not look on any land that is not ours. When the Greeks realized that the Persians were invading again, terror gripped the whole country. For the Athenians, who knew that they would be Xerxes' first target, it seemed that this could only be the end. As panic gripped the city, they turned desperately to their gods. They sent a messenger to the oracle to find out their fate. Here, high in the Greek mountains, can still be found the site of Delphi, the most famous of the Greek oracles. built around a vast chasm in the mountain from which a sacred spring still flows. Here the Greeks would come to discover their future. They would ask questions of the Pythia, the mysterious priestess who spoke with the voice of the god Apollo. People came from all over the Greek world to consult Delphi and sometimes came from outside the Greek world as well. It was considered to be the center of the universe. The omphalos, the navel stone of the whole world was at Delphi. People asked questions about their private life which are just the sorts of questions people want answers to now. Archaeologists have discovered copies of the questions asked of these ancient oracles. Has Aristos stolen the wool from the mattress? Hermione asks, What should I do to have useful children? But as the Athenians walked up this path two and a half thousand years ago, their question was simple and grave. 
What could they do to save themselves? The Oracle's response could not have been more negative. Why sit you, doomed ones? Fly to the ends of the earth. All is ruin, for fire and the headlong god of war shall bring you low. When this message came back to Athens, the democratic assembly dissolved into uproar. It seemed that even the gods had deserted them. But Themistocles refused to panic. He had spent every day since the Battle of Marathon waiting for this moment. He sent the envoys back to Delphi for a second prophecy. Though all else shall be taken, Zeus, the all-seeing, grants that the wooden wall only shall not fail. Argument raged as to what this wooden wall could be. Some said it meant the stronghold at the center of Athens, the Acropolis. But Themistocles had a different idea. He read the oracle and he insisted that it had a different interpretation. He said the ships are the, the wooden barricade which are going to be the key to our success. The Mr. Tlee's plan was daring. Avoid a conflict on land and fight the Persians at sea. He ordered the evacuation of Athens for the first time in her history. This order for evacuation, carved into a stone tablet for public display, is still preserved discovered in the back of a Greek coffee house. The Athenians shall send their children and wives to the village of Troizen. All the men should embark on the 200 ships that have been prepared to fight the barbarian. Themistocles ordered that his fleet of triremes should gather at Salamis, a tiny island off the Athenian coast. Themistocles' strategy is remarkable not only because it is innovative and because it is bold, but because it requires extraordinary self-sacrifice on the part of the Athenian people. He wants every man, woman, and child to leave their homes and possessions and to go into exile. With Athens abandoned, Xerxes' mighty force entered the city. The Persians march in and go up onto the Athenian Acropolis, the symbol of Athens. And they burn it. They burn the temples to the ground. Then you can see the smoke rising from Salamis. This would have been a devastating sight and a humiliating one. They would, in short, have seen their country occupied by a fearsome foreign invader. Surely they would have wondered if they would ever be able to go home again. As night fell, Themistocles met the leaders of the other Greek city-states on the island of Salamis. They had also assembled their much smaller fleets here. Their scouts had reported back. The Persians now not only held Athens, but had also gathered a mighty fleet four times the size of the Greek forces. Mr. Tlee's plans were laid. Themistocles sticks to his guns and his plan is to defeat the Persians at sea. He wants to fight in this narrow body of water between the island of Salamis and the Athenian 
mainland. The trick is going to be to get the enemy to fight there, because the Persians aren't stupid. Themistocles sent his servant to Xerxes with a seemingly traitorous message. The Greeks are afraid and are planning to slip away. They're squabbling with each other and will offer no opposition. You have at this moment an opportunity of unparalleled success. So eager was Xerxes for a crushing victory, he was happy to believe Themistocles' ploy. Xerxes marshals his admirals and they embark and they spend the night rowing. They send a contingent along the eastern defile, the strait there. They try to block up the straits. Only as the dawn rose did the Persians realize the true nature of Themistocles' plan. They discovered the Greeks not in disarray, but ranged in a battle line across the narrows in front of them. The Persian fleet had been lured so far up the straits that it had no room to maneuver. Powerful Greek triremes bore down on them without mercy. The Greek playwright Aeschylus fought in the battle and lived to tell the tale. We heard from every part this voice of exhortation. Advance, ye sons of Greece. From slavery save your country, save your wives, your children save. This day the common cause of all demands your valor. The Greek forces smashed into the cornered Persian fleet. Xerxes himself watched the carnage from his golden throne placed on the shore. At the end of the battle, the Persians had lost 200 ships. For the Greeks, it was a stunning and conclusive victory. Victory at Salamis is tremendously important for Greece and for the Athenians. It breaks the Persian navy. The Persians can no longer guarantee that they can feed their army, nor can they guarantee the safety of the Persian king he must immediately get back to Asia Minor while the going is good. In practical terms, the game is over and the Greeks have won. Themistocles' triumph was complete. He had persuaded the Athenians to build a navy. He had convinced them to sacrifice their entire city to bring them victory at sea. His instincts had been proved right. He had defeated the greatest empire of the day. And he had now placed Athens in a position where she could build an empire of her own. After the years of conflict, this was a new dawn for Athens. Flush with victory, equipped with the largest fleet in the eastern Mediterranean, the tiny democracy began to grow. The Athenians are going to have naval superiority in the Eastern Mediterranean, and that is how great their victory over the Persian fleet is. And this has a momentum 
of its own. Before you know it, the Athenians are the head of a naval confederacy, and they're on the road to becoming a superpower. The Athenians founded the Delian League, an alliance of Greek states designed to keep the Persians in check. Its treasury was located here, on the island of Delos, but the ruins still remain. By 450 BC, this league had more than 200 member states, but Athens was the undisputed leader. The Delian League had become Athens' empire in all but name. And Athens' naval supremacy also gave her economic power. She became a city at the center of a vast trading network. Goods from all over the Mediterranean flooded into her harbors. In its heyday, Athens was the big apple, or if you will, the big olive of the eastern Mediterranean. Constant coming and going of traders. The wharves would be busy, full of people in a cacophony of language. One contemporary author gave an account of the diversity of goods in the Athenian marketplace. From Cyrenia, ox hides. From the Hellespont, mackerel and all kinds of salted fish. Libya provides abundant ivory. Pagasae provides tattooed slaves. Carthage, rugs and many colored cushions. The Athenian Empire was unprecedented in the degree of prosperity that came to it because of its role as a center of trade. The Athenians had access to a quality of life that probably no Greek had ever had before. Athens' rise to economic and political supremacy occurred at lightning speed. After the Battle of Salamis, she became the dominant power in the Eastern Mediterranean in less than a generation. And at the city's heart still lay her unique system of government, democracy. A system of voting using pebbles, olive leaves or the show of hands that decided every aspect of the city's government. Democracy gave the Athenians a great advantage of unleashing talents, powers, opportunities that other cult cultures simply cannot match. The Athenians keenly protected their democracy from any threat, foreign or domestic. Once a year, each citizen could scratch the name of an individual onto a shard of pottery, known as an ostraca, and place it into a pot in the assembly. The person whose name came up most would then be ostracized, banished from the city. This was the Athenians' method of protecting their government, expelling any person they felt might become too powerful. But Athenian democracy could turn on any citizen, even its greatest war hero. Themistocles now found himself under attack. The threat was gone now. His raison d'etre has been taken away. This is something he can't understand. Themistocles reacts 
perhaps in an uncharacteristically crude way, he reminded the Athenian voters of what they owed him. Voters don't want to be reminded in any period of what they owe to their politicians. They want to be told what their politicians can do for them. The Athenian people turned on the aging politician. Calculated, cruel, but deeply democratic. They ostracized the man who had led them to their greatest victory. Themistocles was ostracized, I believe, because he was simply regarded as having gotten too big for his boats. Some of the ostraca with Themistocles' name still inscribed upon them have been found, hidden down an ancient well. Archaeologists believe that these had been pre-prepared by Themistocles' enemies. to be handed out to Athenian voters who couldn't write. Themistocles never recovered from this humiliation. He was to spend the rest of his years wandering from state to state, finally dying in exile in Persia, the country whose defeat had been his greatest triumph. The Athenians were now looking for a leader who might fulfill their newfound sense of imperial glory. They found a man who seemed the perfect reflection of this new ideal. A man who would change the face of Athens forever. A man named Pericles. It's probably not a more important figure in the history of classical Greece than Pericles. He was the leader of Athens at the height of its power and of its artistic achievement. He was the figure associated appropriately with bringing Athenian democracy to its climax, to its height. But Pericles was no obvious democrat like Themistocles, for he had been born into one of Athens' most elite families. Nobody had bluer blood than Pericles. His father was a famous and successful general. His mother came from one of the most distinguished Athenian political families. Pericles was born with advantages and eminence that Themistocles lacked. And perhaps because of his aristocratic origins, Pericles knew what the people of Athens now wanted. A city fit to rule an empire. It seems clear that Pericles had in mind to create a city whose greatness would be admired by the people who lived there, by everybody else in the Greek world, well into the future. Pericles announced a glorious new vision to the Athenian assembly. All kinds of enterprises should be created which will provide inspiration for every art, find employment for every hand. We must devote ourselves to acquiring things that will be the source of everlasting fame. Pericles turned his attention to the Acropolis the sheer peak in the center of Athens, home of the city's patron goddess, Athena. Twenty years earlier, the Persians had burnt down the temples that stood here. Ever since, the Athenians had left these ruins untouched as a memorial to those killed in the war. But Pericles had other ideas. 
He proposed a massive reconstruction plan. At its center would be a new Parthenon, a temple to Athena. And it would be one of the most astonishing buildings of the ancient world. This new construction program was of unprecedented magnitude and expense. The Parthenon in particular was extraordinarily expensive. It was filled with all sorts of architectural refinements. Pericles planned to spend over 5,000 talents in the first year alone. A total budget of more than a billion dollars in today's terms. This project would require 20,000 tons of marble. The Athenian quarries at Mount Pentelicus, just outside the city, resounded as hundreds of workmen traced out and carved great blocks of marble from the mountain. This temple would be decorated like none before. Sculptors and craftsmen were gathered from all over the Greek world. With them stood Pericles, for he treated the building of the Parthenon as his own personal project. He selected architects, he selected the men who designed the plans. Pericles was directly involved in the planning process. Some protested that he was decking out the city like a prostitute. But when the building was completed in only 15 years, his critics were silenced. The Parthenon was and still is the most glorious symbol of Athens Empire. Here was the spiritual heart of the city, the mark of her wealth, power, and artistic genius. When you first came through the door, you'd have been just stunned. You'd have been confronted immediately by an enormous 40-foot high statue of Athena in gold and ivory and studded with jewels. I think the, the impression of a statue of that size and with that kind of dressing must have been truly overwhelming. Pericles had embellished his temple like no other. Though this astonishing statue has since been lost to history, other traitors from the Parthenon have survived for over 2,000 years. The most famous is the Parthenon Frieze. 500 foot long stretch of carved marble which ran around the inner wall of the temple. The Parthenon frieze is only two and a half inches thick at its maximum depth. And yet, in this space, the sculptors carved rank upon rank of crowded figures, a great procession of Athenians glorious and elegant. Here, Pericles offered his fellow citizens a vision of themselves and their democratic state at the height of their glory. Democracy itself becomes heroized in that monument. It's a very democratic thing that wants to include all those citizens who participated in beating off the first great threat to democracy, which was from the Persians, 
These are ideals to which you can aspire. The monuments that Pericles built for his fellow Athenians still stand on the peak of the Acropolis. They remain the most striking legacy of classical Athens, of one of the great empires of the ancient world. 20,000 tons of perfectly proportioned marble carved to sub-millimeter accuracy. The entire structure of the Parthenon is subtly designed to compensate for optical distortion. There isn't actually a single right angle in the entire temple. Pillars swell. The floor is curved, all to give the appearance of perfection. It is an astonishing testament to the achievements of Athenian democracy. But Pericles was not simply concerned with astonishing construction projects. Under his leadership, Athens would also become the intellectual center of the ancient world. The traditional center of Athenian upper-class life had always been the symposium, or dinner party, where guests would gather to eat, drink, and talk. In these years, Pericles played host to an astonishing generation of individuals, figures whose achievements would shape Western civilization. Pericles was remarkable in that he associated with the leading minds of his day in just about every field of endeavor. Pericles was acquainted with the world's first scientists, figures such as Anaxagoras, the first man to realize that the moon was lit by reflected sunlight. He knew Herodotus, the world's first historian, who wrote one of the earliest records of Greek life and poets and authors such as Aeschylus and Euripides, whose works are still standards of world literature. Pericles was well aware of his city's stature. Our whole city is an education, for our citizens excel all men in versatility, resourcefulness and brilliance. Even Pericles' partner, a woman named Aspasia, was unique and distinguished. Pericles had divorced his wife and set up home with a foreign woman, a woman whose occupation was hardly to be expected. For Aspasia was what was known as a hetaira, Greek for a companion. Yes, she was, in a technical sense, I guess, a prostitute, but she was more than that, a woman of charm, of style, of intellect. She really was very extraordinary. She had an extraordinary mind. This relationship caused scandal throughout Athens, not just because of Aspasia's profession, but because Pericles treated her as an equal, something deeply unusual in 5th century Athens. One of the things that created such a stir was that Pericles had her participate in conversations that he had with some of the most important individuals with whom he talked. This jokes to suggest that Aspasia actually was uh, the person who wrote Pericles' speeches. Pericles and his circle were to become one of the most famous and influential groups in Western history. But in 5th century Athens, the highest achievements of art and culture were not restricted to the elite. Here in the shadow of the Acropolis sits the world's first theatre. Twice a year, the Athenian population would gather here to watch a great festival, a festival of drama. Television, cinema, theater, all owe their existence to this place. 
For here is the home of popular entertainment. There's one huge difference between the ancient theatre and our own, and that is that it was incredibly noisy. We hear stories of how, when they didn't like a play, the audience booed and they hissed and they actually got actors driven off the stage. But there's other stories that showed that when they were going with the story and deeply involved in it, they actually all collectively burst into tears. The favourite tales of the Greek stage were called tragedies. These were stories as shocking as a contemporary horror movie. The tragedies told stories of great men falling from the heights, losing everything they owned. Greek tragedy shows human beings, however able, however brilliant, however intelligent, quite unable to alter the destinies which have been decreed for them. These tragedies have fascinated audiences ever since. This 19th century painting shows the story of the mythical ruler Agamemnon, who was murdered by his own wife. Another tragedy told of King Oedipus, who gouged out his eyes when he discovered that he had married his own mother. These Athenians, natives of the greatest city in the ancient world, seemed to revel in seeing how frail greatness could really be. I don't think we can use Greek tragedy to tell us exactly what happened in reality. It's not a document of Athenian social life. But what it does do is take us directly and immediately into the psychological heart of those Athenian men. The kind of dreams and fantasies and fears and imaginary scenarios that they came up with in the theatre have to tell us just as much about them as any document of everyday reality could. Theatres were built in every major Greek city. In Sparta, Corinth, on the island of Delos, here in Delphi. Athens was the heart of a cultural revolution that would spread across the Mediterranean and echo around the world. Pericles in Athens seems to me to belong in the smallish collection of cities where truly great moments in the human experience took place. Culture in the broadest sense reaches a, a peak. But after 20 years of building the cultural capital of the Western world, Pericles and his fellow Athenians would now find that their theater and their tragedies would hold a bitter sting. It is possible to think of Pericles, indeed I think of him, as a man with a tragic flaw, as the sort of man whose greatest qualities, the ones that make him most admirable and successful, turn out to be the seeds of his own destruction. Ultimately, it can be said they lead to the destruction of the Athens that he prized more than anything else. In the coming years, Pericles would embroil his city in the greatest war in the history of classical Greece. He would see her devastated by siege and plague. And he himself would fall victim to a fate the equal of any tragic hero.
Athens, the world's first democracy, the most glorious city in the ancient world. A city of wealth and power, the center of a mighty naval empire. At the head of this state stood one man, a man who seemed to embody all the Athenians' achievements, Pericles. But Pericles would now risk everything he and the Athenians had built in one great gamble. A war that he hoped would make Athens the undisputed ruler of the Mediterranean. This conflict would indeed transform Athens, but in a way Pericles could never have imagined. It would make this man, a common Athenian named Socrates, into the ruler of an extraordinary new empire. An empire that remains the Greeks' last great legacy. An empire of the mind. prison cell in the city of Athens, the year 399 BC. Socrates, the world's most famous philosopher, prepares for his execution. Around him lies a city ruined by war. A nation stripped of glory and empire people who have lost everything. Socrates is perhaps the one man who could have saved his fellow citizens from the greatest defeat in their history. Instead, they have condemned him to death. How could the Athenians come to execute one of their most brilliant minds? How could they lose everything that had once made them great? It is a tale that begins three decades before. In the year 431 BC, the city-state of Athens was the greatest power in the Mediterranean. Under the leadership of the patrician Pericles, this tiny state had built a naval empire that stretched across the Aegean. Her mighty fleet of trireme warships was the most powerful of the day. Athens lay at the center of a great trading network that dealt in goods from as far afield as Britain in the west and India in the east bringing untold wealth into the city. And Pericles had personally devoted himself to making this city the most glorious of the ancient world. He had commissioned the Parthenon, a mighty temple to the goddess Athena, one of the most extravagant monuments in ancient history. But for all his power and sway, Pericles did not rule the city. For Athens was a democracy. This is the assembly area of the Penix, home of Athenian democracy. The system that gave every Athenian citizen a say in the running of their state. Here, Pericles had to stand before his fellow citizens and win the 
the right to lead. One day in the year 431 BC, Pericles took the podium and presented the Athenians with a bold new plan. A proposal that would offer Athens her final crowning glory. Pericles intended to vanquish Athens' last great rival, the city-state of Sparta. Sparta was the only other Greek state that matched Athens' power. The Spartans ruled all of southern Greece, and they were a fearsome military force. Their citizens were trained from birth in the arts of war. Tension had been building between Athens and Sparta for decades. To Pericles, it was now time to take on this dangerous adversary. To make Athens the undisputed leader of the Mediterranean. If we go to war, as I think we must, be determined that we are not going to climb down. For it is from the greatest dangers that the greatest glory is to be won. The assembly embraced Pericles' plan. The Athenians were never once to shrink from a fight. The ancient Greeks as a whole were not by any stretch of the imagination a peace-loving people. Peace was an interruption of war rather than vice versa. And the Athenians were uh, as bellicose as any other Greeks. But Pericles knew that any war with Sparta would not be easy to win for the Spartan infantry were far superior to Athens' forces. Athens' strength lay in her navy. So Pericles proposed a strategy of astonishing complexity and sophistication. He convinced the Athenians to abandon all the land around Athens and retreat behind the great long walls that stretch down from the city to its harbour at Piraeus. Pericles would supply the city by sea. Merchantmen would bring in grain, wheat and other essential supplies from Athens' colonies and allies across the Mediterranean. protected by the mighty Athenian fleet. And Pericles would use this great navy to attack the Spartans from the coast. It was a strategy based on a set of finely judged assumptions. Pericles' expectation was that after a year or two, but no more than three, the Spartans would realize that they could not win the war because the Athenians would never give them the infantry battle they needed in order to win, and they had no other device available. Athens' fleet had always been key to the city's success. It had won the city great military victories, and it had built her an empire. Pericles was sure that this fleet could now bring Athens her greatest triumph. The Athenians crowded behind the city walls. Confident in their vision of imperial power and glory, they assumed that Pericles' strategy could only bring them victory. But among this teeming multitude could be found one man who refused to assume anything. A man unique in Athenian society. A man called Socrates.
If you were an ancient Athenian citizen, the first thing you'd see is a man who was unbelievably ugly. His head was too big, his eyes were too large, his nose was all the wrong shape. Socrates' appearance breaks every rule of classical Greek aesthetics, of the idea of proportion and measure. Socrates walked the streets of Athens barefoot, clad only in a dirty robe. He cared nothing for appearance or any of the other conventions of his day. Socrates was interested only in the mind. This unlikely figure would become the leader of a revolution. A revolution in thinking that had been gathering strength across the Greek world. For thousands of years, mankind had assumed that the world around them, the sun, the stars and the moon, were gods and spirits. Believing they were recording messages from their gods, ancient civilizations such as the Babylonians had gathered great catalogues of astronomical data. This detailed astronomical calendar from Babylon records the rising and falling of the constellations and the gods they represented. This knowledge and study of the heavens had been slowly spreading across the ancient world until it reached Greek colonies on the coast of what is modern-day Turkey. There, a shattering change occurred. For the Greeks took this astronomical knowledge and transformed it. They took the gods out of the heavens and replaced them with reason. Gradually, the Greeks begin to say, these are not persons. These are things. There's an orderly, world which the human mind can actually capture, it is subject to our understanding. These Greeks began to calculate and predict the movement of the moon and stars through mathematics and logic, rather than using gods and spirits to explain everything. It was the birth of science. The first great Greek scientist, a man named Thales, wrote the earliest book on navigation and how to sail using the stars as a guide. And on a journey to Egypt, Thales was the first man to measure the height of the Great Pyramid. Brilliant idea. He stood next to the pyramid until high noon when his shadow was exactly the same length as his height. Uh, and at that point, he measured the shadow of the pyramid and accordingly knew the, <laughs> the height of the pyramid, which is actually an application of a rather sophisticated geometrical theorem. These Greek scientists would go on to measure the circumference of the world when most people still thought it was flat. To devise steam engines, water pumps and suspension bridges. But Socrates was not interested in the mechanics of the physical world. He would use this new way of thinking, using reason and logic to study people. The great change comes with Socrates, who turns his back, so to speak, to the world of nature. What he cares about is the individual. You become an object of study and care. Socrates spent his days in conversation, walking the streets of Athens, talking and debating with anyone he met. With over 150,000 people now packed behind Athens' walls, 
he was in his element. One of the amazing things about Socrates is that he is the first fanatical urban individual. He loves the city. He makes life in the city one of his major concerns. Socrates' life was spent questioning the assumptions his fellow Athenians held about their lives. What they felt was right and wrong, what was good and bad. And he was happy to turn convention upside down. One of Socrates' followers recorded how, at the end of a drunken dinner party, Socrates proved to a fellow guest that he was in fact the better looking of the two. My eyes must be more beautiful because they bulge out, and therefore I can see better. And by the same account, my nose is more beautiful because my nostrils flare out, and so I can therefore gather in more smell. This is typical Socrates, using reason and logic to examine the world anew. Socrates says you must make every decision based on your own understanding of what is good and what is not good, what is right and what is wrong. For Socrates, this freedom of thought was paramount even if it meant upsetting the whole notion of a beautiful nose. I tell you, let no day pass without discussing all the things about which you hear me talking. A life without this sort of examination is not worth living. But as Socrates spent his days in debate, his city was fighting a war. The Spartans invaded Athenian territory and set about burning all the farmland around the city. The Athenians became increasingly anxious. They could only watch from the city walls as their fields and crops were destroyed. But such was Pericles' reputation, he managed to convince the Athenians to stick with his plan. The city could rely on her fleet and shipments from overseas to survive. Little did Pericles know that this fleet now carried an even greater threat. One year into the war, the grain boats that fed the city brought with them an additional cargo. Plague. A disease that would now devastate Athens. Pericles' plan couldn't anticipate difficulties that we now would suggest were rather likely uh, in those circumstances of crowding. And the results were horrendous. With the population crammed behind the city walls, the affliction spread like wildfire. The symptoms were horrific. The Athenian historian Thucydides, who lived through these years, recorded its effects. The body was suddenly seized, first with violent heats around the head and redness and inflammation of the eyes. And then the disease descended into the bowels, producing violent ulceration and uncontrollable diarrhea. The sufferings of individuals seemed almost beyond the capacity of human nature. The city must have looked terrible, smelled terrible, been awful to be in, and terror must have reigned everywhere. Sufferers, racked with fever and overcome with unquenchable thirst, would crawl into the city systems and water mains to die. Thucydides witnessed the scene in Athens' streets. The bodies of dying men lay one upon another, 
and half-dead creatures reeled about the streets. The catastrophe became so overwhelming that men cared nothing for any rule of religion or law. The plague's effects on Athens were absolutely devastating. The whole fabric of Athenian society broke down. Morally, people saw no point in being good. Why be good if the good and the evil die just as easily? The plague would kill over a third of Athens' population. And then it struck the city's figurehead, Pericles. Plutarch, Pericles' biographer, described his symptoms. The plague seized Pericles, not with sharp and violent fits, but with a dull and lingering distemper wasting the strength of his body and undermining his noble soul. By the end, the patrician hero of the city was reduced to relying on potions and magic in an attempt to cure itself. He showed one of his friends a charm that a woman had hung around his neck, as if to say that he was very sick indeed when he would admit of such foolery as this. Finally, after six months of lingering illness, Pericles died in 429 BC. Pericles had planned to make Athens into the Mediterranean's greatest power. But his carefully calculated strategy had brought only disease and death. Like most brilliant men, like most people who have had great success all their lives, Pericles simply underestimated the degree to which some things are out of the control of the very best intelligence and the very best knowledge that there are. Pericles' death would have far-reaching consequences. It soon became clear that this one man had been the linchpin of the Athenian state. Plutarch records that the changes were swift and dramatic. Those who while he lived had resented Pericles' great authority now realized that he had been the main protector of public safety. So great a corruption and such a flood of mischief and vice followed. The flaws in Athenian democracy now became apparent. Without a single strong leader, countless figures now scrambled for the top position. And they were prepared to do anything the people wanted if it gave them power. Pericles' successors, who now wanted to occupy the top position, simply followed the prejudices and passions of the masses in order to gain support. Athenian democracy now revealed a new and terrifying potential. The potential to slide into mob rule. Crippling her ability to fight a war. As the conflict raged on, an Athenian naval force won a skirmish with the Spartans in rough and storm-tossed seas. The generals who had commanded the force returned to Athens expecting a hero's welcome. Yeah. 
Instead, they were thrown into prison. The storm had forced the Athenian commanders to sail straight back to Athens without picking up any of the soldiers who had fallen overboard during the battle. Rabble-rousing speakers had convinced the assembly that this failure to rescue the men was a crime so appalling that all the generals should be summarily tried and executed. We know of only one man who stood up and attempted to calm the fevered assembly. Socrates. Socrates alone and against the very, very serious and vocal and aggressive and mad, furious reaction of the public stood his ground and said it was the wrong thing to do. He was going to vote against it. Socrates' principle of questioning the society he lived in now had a real and practical purpose. He refused to bow to any pressure and thought for himself and do the thing that his conscience and his reasoning told him was the right thing to do. But in the end, Socrates was only one voice amongst the multitude, and he could not sway the assembly. The generals were condemned to death by drinking poisonous hemlock. It would be a terrible loss to Athens' war effort. With the assembly in the hands of self-interested despots, once mighty Athens began to lose her way. After the death of Pericles, Athens never again had a political leader with a well thought out general picture or a set of goals that he could pursue with reasonable hope of bringing them to fruition. The war against Sparta degenerated into a bitter, dragging conflict that spread over a decade. The Spartans ravaged the land around Athens. And the Athenian fleet kept the city supplied. Neither side was able to defeat the other. Deprived of victory, the Athenians grew increasingly frustrated. Were they not the greatest state in all of Greece? Surely the time must come for Athens to prove her power once and for all. Then, in the year 416 BC, a daring proposal was put before the assembly. A proposal which, even if it did not defeat the Spartans, would at least satisfy Athens' hunger for glory. A small Greek colony on the island of Sicily had asked for protection. Protection from a neighbor allied with Sparta. Why should the Athenians not come to their aid, humiliate their Spartan adversary, and perhaps conquer all of Sicily at the same time? As one Athenian addressed the assembly, This is the way we won our empire, and this is the way all empires have been won. Let us set out on this expedition, for it will destroy the arrogance of the Spartans, and at the same time we shall become rulers of all Greece.
was a bold plan to be executed on a vast scale. Requiring a great fleet of warships and a landing force of over 10,000 men. The Athenians threw themselves into the project with fervor. Armorers beat out new weapons. Soldiers tested out their equipment. Stores were loaded onto a fleet of Athenian triremes. And the shipwrights prepared their vessels for the sea. Then, to great fanfare, the mighty invasion force set out for Sicily. Six months later, word came back. The campaign was not going as quickly as hoped. They needed reinforcements. And then, nothing. No news at all. Then, in the autumn of 413 BC, a sailor arrived in the city. A man who needed a haircut. And as he talked to his barber, he told an appalling tale of a vast and terrible slaughter. It was the story of an invading army that had been pinned down where it landed. Of how its leaders had argued with each other about strategy. Of how their food and water had run out. Of how they'd attempted to ford a great river in a desperate attempt to escape. They rushed into it. All discipline lost and every man wanting to cross first. They fell over each other and trod each other underfoot, and they drank thirstily. The water was foul, but still they went on drinking, mud, blood and all, the dead lying thick in the riverbed. This was how the Athenians discovered that they had been the victims of one of the greatest defeats in ancient history. Over 50,000 men had been killed or taken prisoner. Two entire fleets of Athens' prized triremes had been destroyed. The Sicilian campaign is a mess for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's a long way away. It's over six or seven hundred miles. Once they arrive, they squabble and fight about what to do. But perhaps the biggest problem is there's not a tactical reason to do it. There's not a strategic reason to do it. The motivation is highly self-interested. The Athenians, entranced by a vision of imperial glory, had in fact engaged in a pointless and vain campaign. They believed it wrongly that they could go quickly in, raise the countryside, and win a quick victory and a rich tributary subject state. Thucydides recorded the scale of the devastation. This was the most notorious action that we know of in Greek history for they were absolutely, calamitously defeated. The losses were total. Army, navy, everything was destroyed.
With Athens' military power now crippled, her enemies began to close in. The Persians, whom the Athenians had humiliated 50 years before, now saw the ideal opportunity for revenge. They approached the Spartans with the offer of help. The Persians have been watching this carefully and they decide to intervene and subsidize the Spartans and that subsidy is in the form of manpower for rowing and fleet construction. Where previously the Spartans had never been a naval nation, now they had a fleet paid for with Persian gold. With Athens' navy decimated by the defeat in Sicily, the Spartans could now blockade the Athenian harbors. The great grain convoys from Egypt and the colonies could no longer get through. And finally, the Athenians began to starve in the streets. People turned to their patron goddess, Athena. At the height of Athens' glory only 30 years before, Pericles had honored her with the most glorious temple ever seen. But the goddess could offer no help now. Athens, once so sure of her preeminence in the Greek world, was now home to a population ravaged by plague and war, besieged and starving. With her treasuries empty and her once proud fleet crippled. In 404 BC, Athens finally surrendered to the Spartan commander, Lysander. The Spartans' terms were heavy. The great walls which had defended the city were to be torn down. Her fleet was to be destroyed. We had this wonderful scene of Lysander sailing into the Piraeus and dismantling the Athenian fleet. That's important because the destruction is symbolically a destruction of the Athenian Empire. What remained of Athens' mighty navy was put to the torch, with only 12 ships allowed to remain. No longer would she rule the Mediterranean. The Athenians became convinced that they could do, finally, in the end, more than they really could. And I think this is really the, the point in which the potential that Athenian democracy brought about could turn to tragedy. They could achieve great things, they could not achieve all great things. But it would still take one more act of vanity and violence before the Athenians could redeem themselves. And their city could be reborn. Humiliated, their empire lost. The Athenians looked for someone to take the blame for their defeat. They searched for an enemy within their city walls. Someone who had dared to question their dreams of supremacy. They searched for Socrates. 
Socrates was a critic. He was critical of the thinking and the thought processes of his fellow citizens, and he was critical about the public affairs of Athens. For over 50 years, Socrates had been publicly questioning and attacking the traditions of Athenian life. And around him, he had gathered a group of youthful followers. Surely, this must have weakened the city's moral character, undermined her hunger for victory. On the command of the assembly, Socrates was arrested. On charges of questioning the state religion, and corrupting the youth of the city. I am quite sure that especially in a relatively small society like Athens, someone who is constantly questioning the principles by which the society has traditionally governed itself, who we perceived as a very major danger by at least some people in society. You can easily see that a few hundred people might want him out, and they did. The Athenians would now put to trial the one man who dared to question the way they lived their lives. Socrates' trial would be held in Athens' central marketplace under a canopy to shade the fierce heat of the Greek sun. He would be tried by a jury of his fellow citizens, chosen at random. But this would not be a trial we would recognize. The Athenian legal system was remarkably different from a modern system. There are no lawyers involved with this. There is no trained judge involved with this. It is, in some ways, a very frightening system from a modern point of view. Uh, the law did not have the same stature in Athens that it has in a modern society. Socrates would be judged by the same kind of group he had watched condemn six generals to summary execution seven years before. He would be given only a limited time to defend himself. All speeches in the Athenian courts were timed by a water clock. One jar of water steadily running into another. But Socrates shows no fear in the face of his accusers. In fact, he is positively stubborn. He explains that far from corrupting Athens, his life of questioning has done nothing but improve the city. To put it bluntly, I've been assigned to this city, as if to a large horse which is inclined to be lazy and is in need of some great stinging fly. And all day long, I'll never cease to settle, here, there, everywhere, rousing and reproving every one of you. It is not an approach designed to win sympathy. Socrates is setting himself and his life against the entire Athenian state. He is doing what he thinks is the right thing to do. He thinks the life he has chosen, this life of thinking for yourself, is the best life. As he says in his speech, the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. If Socrates had simply apologized to the court, he might well have been acquitted. But instead, he demands free dinners for life, for all the work he has done. I can just imagine what that jury and the audience of that trial must have thought at the time. They must have been absolutely speechless. When the final vote came, the verdict could hardly have been a surprise. The court found Socrates guilty with the penalty of death. But 
But Socrates reacted with calm and serenity. Well now, it is time to be off. I to die and you to live. But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but heaven. Socrates was taken from the court to Athens prison. The site of this prison still exists. We can still trace the layout of the cell in which Socrates was probably held. And we still have accounts of Socrates' last days from friends who visited him in his cell. They are among the most famous Greek writings. For with his death, Socrates would transform Athens. He would show his fellow citizens that the principles of reason, of questioning the world, were something worth dying for. Socrates would be executed in the traditional Athenian manner by drinking hemlock. Some of the hemlock cups used for the poison are still preserved. Death by hemlock is excruciatingly painful, causing gradual paralysis of the central nervous system. But as the moment of his execution drew near, Socrates turned to his friends, treating the whole affair as if it were nothing at all. For me, the fated hour calls. In other words, I think it's about time I took my bath. I prefer to wash before drinking the poison, rather than give the women the bother of washing me when I am dead. But as the hemlock was poured, his friends broke down. We have the account of one named Fido. In spite of myself, the tears came pouring down, so that I covered my face and wept brokenheartedly. And then everyone in the room broke down, except Socrates himself, who said, Really, my friends, what a way to behave. I'm told that one should make one's end in a reverent silence. Calm yourselves and be brave. As Socrates lay back on his bed and let the poison take effect, his friends watched in silence. Here was a man who was dying not for glory, not for fame and honor, but for the sake of his principles because he believed that man should question the world around him. It was a sight they would never forget. Socrates, in his life and in his death, becomes a completely new Greek hero. From now on, the hero is a person of conviction a person who will follow nothing but the dictates of his intellectual conscience, and that is a new conception of what a human being is like and what a good human being must be like. For centuries, the Athenians had believed in one ideal. The vision of a martial warrior hero. It had driven them to conquer great foes, to build a mighty empire. But now, in the depths of defeat, they discovered a new figure to venerate. Effigies of Socrates have been found amongst the ruins of the Athenian prison. 
perhaps offerings to the dead philosopher. Perhaps the most important lesson that Socrates left is the need to be critical and the need to be self-critical. The interesting thing that I see in Athens in the years after the execution of Socrates is this same capacity to look at themselves and recognize that they have perhaps gone too far in the past and indeed to embrace a certain kind of maturity. Athens was never again a great imperial power. But neither did her democracy lapse again into mob rule. Instead, she became a city of intellectual inquiry. A haven of study and discussion where Socrates' students and his students' students slowly began to build a world based on reason. Plato tried to formulate the ideal society. Aristotle studied nature, establishing biology and zoology. And slowly the ideas and work of these Greek thinkers began to spread across the known world. One could say that a major part of the energy of the Athenians turns into building what one might call empires of thought. So where before you had Athens sending its ships to the various islands in order to collect taxes, here you have reason extending its dominion over all areas in which our lives are actually lived. Socrates' principles of reason, of questioning assumptions and the world around you, still endure. In the space of less than 200 years, the ancient Greeks transformed their world. For amongst these ruins, a few great figures carved a mighty empire. They invented democracy and politics, science and philosophy. They gave us literature and drama, art and monuments which still take our breath away. And ultimately, these Greeks taught us how to reason and think. Two and a half thousand years later, their astonishing achievements continue to shape our world.